This afternoon, I'm talking with my friend, William Vanderblumen. And William, it's good to connect with you again. Good to see you, Tony. Always good to visit. You, usually, we're uh, talking about filling uh, roles, uh, uh, whether it's a senior pastor, executive pastor, all the different roles that uh, your team fills with the Vander, Vanderblumen Search Group. Even I stumble over it, William. <laughs> I, I, I tell people I didn't pick my name out. <laughs> but uh, today I'm excited because uh, finally uh, you have a book coming out and it's on a critical topic. Uh, it's about succession. The book is called Next. Uh, and I'm just curious, William, why don't we just start there? What prompted you to write the book? I think what prompted me to write the book was uh, six years ago or so when I started doing I tried to find resources that would teach me about pastoral succession and couldn't find them. And uh, we've had to learn from asking a lot of people. Uh, Bob Russell was kind enough to, you know, talk to us a little bit about his book when it first came out, and uh, that was a good resource. What we found, so there's no uh, cookie cutter approach to succession planning. There, there are different kinds of stories, and it, and it's really not about retirement. Uh, it's whenever you leave your church. And um, the longer we've done this, the more convinced I am of a line. I think, it, I think we may have even uh, been talking when it came out was, uh, you know, every pastor is an interim pastor. Hmm. Uh, you'll, you'll either be pastor of the church when your church closes, which is not really appealing, or when Jesus returns, which is great, but I might not want to bank on that one today. Uh, or somebody else is going to be the pastor after you. And uh, that, that just seems to be a looming crisis in the church that no one really wants to talk about. It's, it's uh, one of those important uh, but not seemingly urgent tasks that gets put off uh, under the, what do they call it, the tyranny of the urgent. So a uh, long period of time went by. I, you, know, you talk to publishers and say, hey, I got a great idea for, for a book. It's on succession planning. And you would think they would just say, no way, nobody's going to buy that. I told them my mother to buy 50 copies. And, uh, <laughs> that, and that, I guess that helped. But uh, we actually had several publishers uh, kind of bidding on the book. It, it seems to be a topic a lot of people are interested in. And I hope, it, hope it's one that will help the kingdom a lot. Well, you found a, a great partner in this project, working with Warren Bird, who is with the Leadership Network. And I know that over the last, what, probably more than a year, you and Warren have been doing quite a bit of research uh, in preparation for the writing of this book. And I'm just curious to know what that research looked like. Sure. Uh, we started, I guess it's been a year and a half now that we've been working on this book. And that included... Uh, to some research into the searches that we've done here at, at uh, Vanderbilt and Search, which, you know, we've crossed the 500 mark now in numbers of searches done, and, and it continues to mushroom into kind of a global thing and, and a whole lot of what we get asked to do is succession. So uh, we looked at that, but more importantly, we targeted uh, churches that were known as successions that were both, there were some that were good, there were some that weren't good, there were some that were ugly, and we went around and, and interviewed pastors and elders. And I think all in, uh, we, we had right at 200 face-to-face -face interviews with pastors. We studied several churches. We did case studies where there weren't interviews involved. And then we did other things like uh, there's some nice tables and graphs in the, in the book about ages of the pastors of the largest churches in the country, um, sizes of the churches that were the largest in the country like 20, 30, 40 years ago. And it's staggering how many of them had a bad succession and are not large anymore. So there's a lot of, a lot of information in the book. It's not, uh, we want it to be a very readable handbook for guiding a, a pastor and his board through a succession plan. Uh, and frankly, all the people that read it for us said, I'd read it just for the stories because you get to hear some of the stories about what happened at the Crystal Cathedral or, uh, First Baptist Dallas, or some of the great stories of three generation successions in a row, some international successions. So it's 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 uh, hopefully informative, but also very readable. I'm curious to know, as you were looking at all that research, what what was the most significant trend that you identified? 
Oh, uh, there were several. I would say the thing that uh, I had a hunch might be true, and I was just shocked at how true it is, is that there's no cookie cutter approach to succession. Uh, I, I would say anybody who says, here are my nine steps to a successful succession, I, I would run away as fast as you can because there's just successions not only involve a church, which is very nuanced, but it involves people that are living organisms, you know, and there's just going to be some chaos and, and some sort of handcrafting that has to go around every succession. Uh, we did find some trends that were good. There's one chapter in the book. I think you can even download a white paper that's a short version of the chapter. Uh, within all those contextual searches, there were some bedrock things that seemed to work. Uh, we named the title of the chapter, The Ten Commandments of Succession Planning. And uh, that, that gets people off to a helpful start. Uh, and I think the, the trend that surprised me the most was how much people are talking about succession now. It's like maybe all I have is a hammer so everything looks like a nail, but uh, everywhere I go, I hear the conversation coming up. There's just a lot of pastors out there, particularly those who founded churches and planted them in the 80s and 90s, who are entering a stage where it's like, wow, we need to think this through. And, and younger pastors who are saying, wow, I need to make a 10, 15, 20 year plan. Yeah. Well, and I would suspect too, William, that uh, it used to be the denomination provided the succession plan, but anymore, either we're talking about non-denominational churches or unique churches within denominations where there just isn't that next person to step into a role. Wouldn't that be the case? Yeah, I think I think that's exactly right, Tony. And and you know, the denominational structures now, I'm sure they're well intended and have good people that love the Lord in them, but they're, they're just not very functional. And so um, we're, we're also seeing, you know, the church, what's the saying? The church raises the flag at sunset. You know, we pick up on trends a little later than the, the rest of the world sometimes. And I think that's true with succession. I mean, it wasn't too long ago in the corporate world where Sorbane's Oxley was passed that required boards to show succession plans in place and became kind of a hot topic uh, many years ago in the corporate world and is now becoming a topic in, in the uh, church world. And you can't apply all the principles there. I mean, you know, for instance, in a corporation, you usually have three in-house candidates that you just kind of let them fight it out for a few years. That doesn't work real well on a church staff where we're supposed to be known by our love and one family and all that kind of thing. But I would say, uh, and I, I know you share this, we don't want just one generation churches where they have one great run of ministry and then there is a transition and the church ends up dying at that point. So I'm glad more churches now are beginning to think about succession as well. So uh, what, what's one of the common mistakes then as you looked at all of those interviews and the research that uh, you and Warren uh, developed, what was one of the biggest mistakes that jumped out? Uh, I think the, the, the three, uh, and I'm going to assume, let's talk about pastors that are retiring at this point. So there's all kinds of other transitions. You might be a youth pastor and you know you're only there for five years and then you're going to move to maybe plant a church. There needs to be a succession plan in place there. Uh, I think that uh, the lack of an emergency plan is staggering. The what happens if I get hit by a bus or I quit or there's a scandal or whatever, what happens if, or if I get, I, I catch something that knocks me out for six months or a year. Uh, there are very, very few churches that actually have a plan. It made us at the firm get, take a long, hard look at our staff and say, okay, what happens if you go out? Part of your annual review is showing me that you've got somebody who can step in if you're not working. And I think across the board, that needs to be in place. I mean, like particularly some of the lo lower level positions like children's pastor. What do you do if your great children's pastor leaves? You know, that, that's, that's a big mistake. Uh, on the retirement end though, there seem to be three uh, streams that run pretty regularly. One is, uh, I'll call it uh, Brett Favre syndrome. And, and that is, uh, you know, this number one fear of people is public speaking, right? You know, the old line, they'd rather be the subject of a funeral than the speaker at the funeral. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, for God to gift a pastor with the ability to speak publicly every week, that takes a real amount of gumption. And, and not just speak, but to speak, here's what God says for your life. Uh, that's a big thing. Uh, what we found is that there may be a shadow side there. 
And the shadow side of that gift is the voice that will whisper in your head saying, you got one more season. You can play for the Vikings. Why don't you come out of retirement one more time? And before you know it, you've stayed too long and you're the conversation that happens after you leave the room. What do we has been here so long and served so faithfully, but it's time. Uh, so that, that's one of the three. And then uh, two reasons people that we found stay too long is uh, pastors and their boards have done a pretty poor job of creating options for a future identity. And what I mean by that is I don't know another profession that consumes your whole life like ministry. You know, if you're a doctor, you can go have a hobby somewhere else and you go to church somewhere else. But the church absorbs all of a pastor and his spouse's life. It's where your friends are. If you bury your friends, you, you pray to your kids. It's your social life. It's your spiritual life. And when you step away from that and don't have that identity as pastor anymore, it's, it's pretty devastating. Uh, successions that go well, the pastor has a new area of passion, uh, a new identity, a new role, maybe even a role within the church that's very well defined and sort of uh, uh, sequestered from bleeding over into the new pastor's role. And, and then the, the third thing that really no one wants to talk about is uh, pastors just don't have enough money to retire. Uh, they, they're sheepish about asking for raises or boards don't want to give them. Uh, quite often pastors in churches that have uh, members that do well in the world uh, are, are expected to keep up with their membership socially, show up at the Christmas parties and such. And so pastors live kind of hand to mouth and they give away what they have that's extra. And when it's time to retire and people are living longer now than ever before, they just don't have the money. So we, we found the three things we would say everybody ought to do is emergency plan, start to create options for yourself when you're finished, and uh, make sure you've got enough money for retirement. And, and some of that's on the church board as well, but that, that's a, a long-winded answer because I am a recovering preacher. <laughs> and I noticed that that message just had three points too. So. That's right. I can skip <laughs> forward if you want. <laughs> All right. Well, let's, uh, let's uh, finish the conversation here, William. I, for the, uh, This is not the, the pastor on the verge of retirement, but uh, the guy that's in, in senior pastor, lead pastor role, uh, maybe retirements a decade or more in the future, what can they be doing today uh, to prepare them for a su successful transition down the road? Yeah, I, well, real quickly, I go back to the two things that uh, were the last two of the three that I mentioned uh, previously. When I was a young pastor, I had a mentor who pulled me aside and said, William, smart leaders create options for the latter part of their life. And so I don't know if that's starting to, uh, I've seen one succession plan where the pastor started sewing into a ministry in India and training pastors in India. So when it came time to leave, he had a whole new thing to do. And the church gave him seed money to, to be funded for three years just to help bless him and get him off the ground. And it gave him something to do and have an identity. So create some options. Um, and maybe that's not in the church. Maybe it's in a nonprofit or, uh, you know, maybe it's a, a golf course. I don't know, but create options and smart financial planning. Uh, I'd also say uh, outside of those two, the thing that we learned from the corporate search world that was shocking is a very standard first board meeting for a CEO has one agenda item. Your first meeting as CEO, we're going to talk about your succession and then we're going to revisit it every year. And it doesn't happen often, but the companies that do it, do it well. So what, what would it be like if you were a young pastor and you said, let's talk about when I finish here and how we do that well. Let's talk about the markers that would show, okay, we've been in plateau for 15 years now and I'm 63. Maybe there's a, you know, if you could set those markers early, then there wouldn't have to be hard conversations because you've been having annual conversations about metrics and where the church is going and how you're doing. So I, I think uh, create options, make sure you've got enough money. And, and start the conversation early. Your, your board is not gonna start this conversation for you, and if they do, it's too late. So uh, it's usually because they're trying to give you a message. So pastors really need to own the conversation from the beginning, and uh, frankly, it's, it's the best legacy you'll be able to leave your church. Very good, all right, William. I really appreciate your insights. Uh, and the fact that you and Warren uh, invested so much time and effort into pulling this book together. 
and certainly the book is going to give folks some next steps that they can take related to succession. But I'm assuming your firm can help people too if they find themselves in a place where they need assistance. Yeah, I mean, my, my biggest recommendation with the book is don't read alone. Read it with your board. Let it be the conversation starter for your board. Make it your board retreat. Everybody's looking for a board retreat material. Just use that and go. And when you get in a place where you need some consultation or if you have a, a, a plan that needs to be executed and, and a search that needs to be done, uh, give us a call. We'd be honored to help you. Very good. All right. Thanks again, William. It's been great uh, connecting with you again today. Sure thing. Hey, the book actually does exist. Oh, we there we go. Like yesterday. So, uh, yeah. So thanks for making time to let us share it with you, Tony. Always a pleasure to visit.